So this year we're pleased to be able, uh, I should say we're pleased and honored to be able to present the two-year follow-up data of Zuma 3. One of the big questions that arose when we initially presented the trial was whether the durability of remission and the survival would be maintained with extended follow-up. Uh, a concern in particular was that short-acting cars, CD28-based cars, would uh, be more prone to relapse over time. It's an interesting concern, and I say that because we haven't seen that in the lymphoma population. But ALL is a different disease, and, and some would argue that you need more pressure over time on residual blasts or pre-leukemic blasts to facilitate durable remissions. And so I think uh, we really needed to come out and show that these patients uh, are still doing well with time, and that's indeed what we did show the duration of remission seems to be maintained. Uh, and uh, that's with and without censoring. The group that seems to be struggling with CAR T-cell therapy are those with very high tumor burden. They're less likely to achieve a true CR. They're uh, less likely to receive a resp uh, to, to, to respond at all, actually. And when they do respond, those durations of remissions are shorter. So when I say high tumor burden, what I'm referring to for the Zuma 3 trial are those patients with 75% and higher blasts. This is in contrast to published reports showing that 5% blasts are the threshold for high tumor burden. I think this is an important observation. Patients had to have at least 5% blasts to enroll. In fact, the initial cohort on Zuma 3, the phase one trial, they had to have higher, more than 25% blasts in order to participate on the study. So when we say high tumor burden, we mean very high tumor burden. And I think this uh, is an unmet need right now. I'm hopeful that with more novel bridging approaches, so when I say bridging, after we collect the T cells, we're able to now treat during that process of T cell manufacturing with therapies that are novel. Inotuzumab or inotuzumab combinations are associated with very high rates of uh, complete remission, MRD negativity by flow. We may be able to take advantage of that and use that as a, a means to get patients into a deeper remission before CAR T cell therapy without necessarily uh, experiencing a high amount of toxicity that we might see if we used higher or more intensive chemotherapy approaches in, in that same vein. So, I'm hopeful that we'll find novel approaches to engender lower disease burden going into the CAR T-cell therapy, and that that will give us a much better response, response duration, and of course, overall survival. I want to speak a little bit to age, and that was the other thing that we wanted to explore as, uh, as part of this updated analysis. Were there correlates, uh, in particular, with survival? And fascinatingly, no. We didn't see it. There was uh, certainly, it, it looked like there were improved outcomes for those who were young. This is in the 18 to 25 year old group, but also the older patients, those 65 and above. And, and so I think that's very, uh, very interesting. We do uh, provide a, you know, a, a survival plot looking at this in a univariate uh, fashion. And, and so I, uh, I was surprised by the findings. I certainly would have expected, as with everything else we've done, young patients do best, oldest patients do worse, but it's not what we saw. The uh, other analysis that we wanted to look at was toxicity. And we wanted to understand whether tumor burden or age played a significant role in increasing the toxicity associated with CAR T-cell therapy? And the answer is not in the way you'd expect. So we did not find any clear association with age and neurotoxicity or cytokine release syndrome. So when we talk about restricting our analysis to an adult population, the, uh, the answer uh, does not seem to be as clearly, does not seem to be age associated. Keep in mind, we had small numbers in some of the age groups. For those 65 and older, it was five patients. And so there may be some caveats there that, that you know, or uh, there may be, uh, not, there may be. I think there is a need to expand those populations to really have a greater sense of certainty that yes, those patients are gonna do well in, in, as it relates to CRS and neurotox. 
Um, the other thing we looked at was tumor burden, as I alluded to earlier, and perhaps counterintuitively, those with higher tumor burdens ha did not show higher toxicity. In fact, we saw, uh, a, again, a trend towards increased toxicity as the blast burden came down in the 25 to 50 uh, and 50 to 75 percentile range. And again, it was a trend. I don't want to make mountains out of, out of molehills, but that's probably a function of T-cell expansion. When we looked in the, when we published the Lancet manuscript of the phase two data, we actually broke it down by quartile, zero to 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, 75 and above. And we could show for each quartile increase in blast burden at the time of infusion, the expansion went down, the peak went down and the AUC went down. And so we also showed in that same manuscript that the toxicity correlated with expansion. Those with the highest expansion were more prone to develop grade three and above CRS or neurotox. And so what that then tells me looking at this data set is, okay, we got better expansion with these intermediate um, blast burdens. And that's probably what was driving that signature for toxicity. We did have a few patients enroll with less than 5% blast. Again, it was a few patients because this analysis, the cut point was at the time of, uh, we, we did a marrow right before lymphodepletion. And we did see one out of those five patients develop CRS, you know, grade three CRS uh, or grade three neurotoxicity. And so uh, it's a small number. It's hard for me to know what that means. Certainly the majority of the patients did not. And that's um, also an encouraging uh, observation. Why is it encouraging? Well, for the reasons I told you, I think we're going to get better at bridging. I think we're going to be taking patients into CAR T who don't have explosive leukemia. Number two, I think we're going to move this up. I think if we're seeing these durable remissions, we have a responsibility to start thinking about how we bring CAR T forward. Certainly, we're not compromising overall survival, the ultimate benchmark which was outstanding in this data set. When we looked at our phase one and phase two uh, populations combined, I think it was, I think the median overall survival was 47 months in this, those with uh, CR uh, and CRI. So outstanding data. And I think uh, a lot to, to sort of process and think about now in terms of next steps, in terms of how we move that up forward in, uh, in, in our treatment algorithms for acute lymphoblastic leukemia.